The Federal Reserve has discontinued publishing their M1 and M2 money stock series. Here to discuss the implications and what this means and why they've done this is an expert on monetary policy, Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Hankey, welcome back. Let's talk about this. Why has the Federal Reserve discontinued these series? They've been publishing this since the 70s, you told me offline. Yes, they've been publishing uh, various monetary statistics and statistical series since 1971, so-called M1, M2, M3, and so forth. But they've changed the definitions and the frequency with which they report them, and, and they've discontinued some series. I think that before we get started, uh, David, let, let me remind you of President Bill Clinton's maxim. It, he, he had a maxim that was, it's the economy, stupid. And my maxim, it's the money supply, stupid. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the money supply determines the course of nominal GDP. And nominal GDP includes real growth and the inflation rate. That's what makes up nominal GDP. So if we go back, let, let's kind of get the story before we get into the weeds on the, on the technical statistical yeah. series. And, 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 and to set the stage is really what people have to get in mind. Measuring money and the money supply became very important in the United States when Paul Volcker became chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1979. And shortly after he became chairman, he said that we are going to start watching the money supply. It is the money supply, stupid. And the reason for that is that the inflation rate in the United States, when Volcker entered the scene, was 13.3 percent, low double-digit inflation. It was, it was stagflation in those years. And so he slowed the money supply down, measured by M2, that, that particular version, which actually has nine components in it. Uh, starting with currency and, and uh, uh, then demand deposits and savings deposits and so forth and so on. But M2, he was using as, as his measure. He cranked it down to 7%, put a squeeze on, and by 1982, the inflation rate in the United States had, had been squeezed down to 3.8%. But there, there was a problem. And, and that is, we experienced two recessions, one in 1980, which was very mild, and then a, a fairly severe one in 1982. So the squeeze that he put on got inflation down, but it squeezed a lot of real GDP out of the system. Now, the reason for that was due to the money supply measurements. Volcker had the thing right. It was the money supply. He had to focus on the money supply. He had to slow it down. But he thought by looking at the Fed's measures of M2 that he, he was slowing it down to around 7% per annum growth. In fact, if you measured the money supply growth properly, money supply was actually contracting. It was, it was going negative on him, but he didn't know that. So the key thing is you have to measure the money supply correctly. You've got to get the, the, the correct measure on your dashboard or, or you've got a big problem. Okay. So it is the money supply that's very important. And, and when I say the money supply measured properly actually went negative, what do I mean? What was going on? There's something called the divisia measure of money supply. And, and it happens that the world's expert on this is uh, Bill Barnett, professor at the University of Kansas and, and also uh, uh, a fellow at the Center for Financial Stability in New York, where Divisia measures of the money supply are actually published. Now, what is divisia? Well, if you look at the normal measure of the money supply, whether it's M1 or M2, it, it's those are called simple sum indices. In other words, you have 
various components. I said there were nine components in M2, and, and you just add those nine components up, and that's a simple sum, and that gives you the total M2. Now, Divisia does things differently. Divisia says, yeah, there, there are nine components in M2, but each one of those has a different degree of moneyness in it. In other words, currency gets 100% weight because it, 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 you can use it immediately for a transaction. A checking account is also in M2, and that, that gets a, a, a also 100% weight. But other things that are in the components, the other components get less than 100% weight, and that weight changes around depending primarily on the interest rate. Let's say the interest rate in Volcker's time on uh, savings accounts went, went to the moon. I mean, it was up in double digits. Well, in that case, the opportunity cost of you exchanging your savings account or your money market account or wh whatever the component happened to be in the money supply that you were measuring, you, you'd be very reluctant at those high interest rates to actually cash out of your money market account and, and, and obtain cash that is, is money and can be used directly in transactions. So as a result of those high interest rates, the Divisia measure of M2 actually went negative in the, in the early 80s and, and that would have been the proper measure, that would have been the right thing to have on your dashboard. Unfortunately, the Fed wasn't producing it and Volcker didn't have it, so Volcker thought he, he was not squeezing excessively. He thought he was right on the money at, at squeezing things down to about 7% M2 growth with this simple sum Fed number. But the real number was negative, and that's why we had these two recessions. Yeah, I want, I want to ask you about uh, what you said earlier on, on the priorities of the Federal Reserve. So before Volcker realized money supply was important as a tool for measurement, but now you're saying that the Federal Reserve no longer thinks that money supply is important? Is this a change in monetary policy? What's with this change in attitude? Where did it come from? Uh, it, 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 it's, it goes, it's with Chairman Paul, it, it's, uh, he, he is very explicitly claims that money doesn't matter. I mean, in recent testimony, he's basically said that money and the measurement of money You're doesn't right. really matter because it, he, it's unrelated to inflation. Yes. M2, he said, is unrelated to inflation. So that was a fairly explicit well, he, thing. He said, before, he said specifically uh, the, the correlation between money supply growth and inflation historically, that correlation is not strong. Is that, is that even correct, well, Professor? Yeah, that, that is incorrect. He said M2, which is uh, the broadest measure that they're reporting at the Fed now. If you measure broadly at M3 or M4, that what he said is not correct. If you, you, if you measure everything that has moneyness in it, uh, all, all, they're, they're actually M4, what, what Professor Burnett's measuring, M4, Divisia, has 14 measures in it, including treasury bills are even included as the last component. Now, they, they get a lot less weight in the Divisia index than, than does something like currency or, or checking deposit. But they still get weight, and, and, and there are a lot of treasury bills out there. So even if you're weighting them lightly, the total uh, amount adds up to a big number. And, and when, when, I, when, I told my, when I told my peers they were doing this, my, the first response I got was, this sounds suspicious. It's a little bit fishy. Maybe the Federal Reserve is trying to hide something. Well, what they're, what, they are trying to hide something. They're, they, they've changed the reporting frequency on M2 to monthly now, not weekly. So, so they don't want people paying attention to money supply growth. And the reason why is that in principle, they, they don't think it's important. They, they want to deep six the monetarists, basically. And, and push them off to the side. Is this because of MMT? They, they, they want to they wanna bury Milton Friedman once and for all and be done with it. And, and their preference probably would be to not report any monetary statistics. Now, Friedman, of course, was, was a monetarist and was looking at the money supply correctly. 
and 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 if you measure it broadly, correctly, like Barnett is with the Divisia indices, you, you you get a very nice relationship between the growth of broad money measured by Divisia M4 and the growth in nominal GDP. So let me let me ask you this. Like, yeah, let ahead. me ask. Powell has said that he does not expect inflation to be a long-term persistent force. Do you think maybe they're, they've discontinued publishing these money supply series so that narrative could be better be supported by existing data? Well, uh, Because to according a, to this chart, let's to just take a, a look at this chart, to, right? To I mean, you, it's spiked to, to up. You, yeah. To give you a short answer, Yes, they, they, they don't want people looking at these money supply numbers. And the w reason why that chart that you have up there on the wall yeah. shows that M2 is, is spiked up. Now, what that means in most people's mind, the money supply has exploded and we can expect a lot more inflation going forward. Now, the Fed wants to control inflation expectations what people think about inflation. And the best way to control that is just take that chart off the wall, get, <laughs> get rid of it. Okay, we've gotten that, rid of it. That's, that, that's the name of the game. It, it's to control monet, inflation expectations. And if you don't report monetary statistics on a, on a frequent basis and, and have it as a headline kind of number, like in the old days, by the way, the weekly reports under the Humphrey Hawkins Act, those weekly reports were paid attention to by everybody. I mean, they were reported and highlighted in the Wall Street Journal and all the financial press. Now you've got to hunt around, almost be an expert to figure out what in the world's going on or go up to the Center for Financial Stability in New York right. and, and get, get the number or something like that. So right. this is... This is to dampen down. They don't want to get the public excited about inflation. And Powell's saying, he, number one, he, we're, we're not going to be reporting monetary numbers, he, even, even the incorrect kind of numbers or incomplete numbers that they have in M2. We're not going to report those every week. We're going we're gonna to keep those to a monthly basis. So that's, that's one thing going on. This started, by the way, in 2006 with Bernanke. He, he stopped per, they, the Fed. Chairman Bernanke was the chairman of the Fed then. They stopped reporting M3 completely in, in 2006. So there have, been, there have been a couple of big changes recently. And, and this is trying to deep six monetarism, deep six the importance of money, control inflation expectations all these things are all wrapped up in one so they're and trying to get they're trying to get rid of monetarism and replace it with what professor well they they want you to start looking at things like interest rates for example that that would be one thing but interest rates are a very misleading indicator of monetary policy let me just take you through this sequence david let, let's say that we're tightening monetary policy. Now, what happens first is that the Fed says, okay, we're going to tighten monetary policy. Short-term interest rates go up. The money supply starts dropping. Inflation starts dropping because nominal GDP is dropping. And then on a sustained basis, what happens to interest rates? They go down when the money supply uh, uh, the, 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 the money supply goes down, inflation goes down, and sustained long-term interest rates go down, not up. So that's why you get a confusing signal. They say, oh, we're going to tighten, and people say, oh, yeah, interest rates are going up. Interest rates do go up, but eventually what happens on a sustained basis, they go down. Now, if you're loosening, you get exactly the opposite happening. You, you say, oh, we're going to loosen up monetary policy and goose things a little bit. Interest rates in the short term temporarily go down. The, the money supply goes up. Inflation goes up. And, and on a sustained long-term basis, what happens to interest rates? They go up. They don't go down. So are you saying so, we're still in a loosening period or are we in a tightening period now? No, 
well, now we're in a loosening period. The money supply is skyrocketing. And, sure. and what, what, what that means is, yeah, and, and, and the interest rates, when they first started a year ago, interest rates went down, down, down. All right. Now the money supply key is bubbling along, cranking along at, at over uh, Divisia M4, over 28% yeah. per annum. Uh, greatest expansion since 1943 in, in broad money. Okay. And what happens? Inflation starts going up and interest rates starts going up. That's why the bond market's going wild. Long-term interest rates are going up. They're not going down. Right. So, so that's one reason that, that the, the, the Fed, they don't want you looking at money. They want to talk about interest rates. That's a very misleading thing to be looking at and a very confusing thing. Also, inflation, because they're inflation targeting. That gets to another measurement problem. That, yeah, How I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, people people agree with you. We should have inflation, but the CPI hasn't shown that yet. So either we haven't had the CPI numbers reflect uh, higher levels of inflation yet. Maybe it'll take some time, or maybe the CPI itself is not an accurate indicator of inflation. Where do you stand on this? Well, uh, the, the, I, I, it, it is one measure, but there there are a lot of measures. The CPI now in the United States is going up at at 1.7 percent per annum, and and the, but the core inflation number, excluding volatile food and energy prices, is only going up at 1.3 percent. The producer price index for raw material inputs going up at 2.8 percent. Food is going up. The food inflation index is going up at 3.6 percent. So you've got all kinds of indices, everything, different kinds of baskets in, in various indices. So the question, if you're going to have an inflation target and, and you're the central bank, well, how do you measure it? What is inflation? And that gets in, well, what's in the basket? And then how do you accurately measure what's in the basket? I mean, do you measure listed prices on things or do you actually measure what people actually pay for something uh, when they buy it on a discount or or if the item is purchased in, in a, a large bulk quantity they're getting a lower price than the list price so so you have all kinds of problems with the with these price indices so wow. again again it's a very fuzzy kind of notion what what price index is appropriate for the Fed to be trying to target? Good question. Well, the best thing is to go back to the money supply. It's the money <laughs> supply, stupid. Let me, let me tie it's this back in. Let me tie all this together now, Fresh. I have one more question. One of the tenets of modern monetary theory, MMT, is that an increase of the money supply doesn't necessarily have to lead to inflation. Do you think that's the attitude the Federal Reserve is adopting? And this is potentially why well, I think they the, stopped publishing M1, the, M2? I, I, yeah. I, I think de facto, the, the answer is yes. I mean, you've asked me a rhetorical question in a way. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you, you, you've obviously sniffed the thing out. You, you're, you're like a good hound dog who's sniffing on the trail of something. And I think you're right on the money. I, I don't. I don't want to make assertions or assumptions. I. 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 Uh, I, I asked a question, hoping maybe. Maybe you might say no. I mean, I. I don't know. But you. You somehow. I'm saying yeah. I'm saying <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good, Steve. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to be following up with you a couple of uh, very shortly. And I want to talk about failed currencies. It'll be a very good conversation for the next episode. But thank you for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me. Have a good day. You too. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin.